Okay, well, um, what, what I'm wanting to do in, in this period of time, as I've already told you, I want to look at the Olivet Discourse, but not the entire discourse. Uh, I want us to be looking primarily at what's in Matthew 24, uh, particularly verses 1 through 35. And this evening, I, I, what my focus is, is um, looking at well, looking at different features that tell us what Jesus is talking about here. We're going to, you know, just briefly survey the different views, I mean, very generally. But uh, I want to give you some key points from this passage that I believe demonstrate, proof that Jesus is talking here about the events that are preceding and surrounding uh, 70 AD and that he is not talking about the um, events prior to the rapture uh, and the second coming of Christ, at least not in Matthew 24. Uh, we're going to see some of the reasons why there are those who believe that, because, you know, when you move on from 24 into chapter 25, which is a part of the same discourse, Jesus is clearly speaking about his second coming and final judgment. So how do we make sense of all of this? Well, hopefully we'll, we'll see. But let me begin by reading the text just to get it in front of us, although most of what we're going to read here in this passage we're not going to look at this evening, but what we are going to look at is sprinkled throughout. So Matthew 24, beginning in verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples... When his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather." But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the, heaven, the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. 
And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Now here, again, is the key. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. All right, well, that's quite a mouthful. And we're not going to look at everything that we just read, but we, we do want to see some key points uh, regarding this passage this evening. Now, just by way of review, remember we've been looking at prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the ways we can prove that the Bible is God's Word. Now, the way it proves it is in this way. We know that God exists from the creation, and we know that God is infinite. Now, I hope this point makes sense. To be infinite means to be infinite or limitless in absolutely every way. You can't be infinite and limited, okay? Which means that if this infinite being has knowledge, that knowledge must be infinite. And only one who has infinite or limitless knowledge can possibly know what is going to take place in the future. Now, we've seen that the Bible claims to be from God. And one of the ways that we can see that it is from Him is that it contains many predictions, what we call prophecies, of what will take place in the future. Actually, it contains predictions of what would take place in the future, as well as fulfillments of those things, or we've seen the fulfillment of many of them, things that were predicted hundreds or thousands of years before they came to pass, and they came to pass with amazing accuracy. And since we know that only the one with infinite knowledge can possibly predict the future, we must believe the Bible is the Word of God, the God we see in the creation. You know, again, let me just remind you that most people in the world believe that God exists. I mean, Paul says, Romans chapter 1, they all really do believe that He exists. But they don't all believe that He is the God of the Bible or that the Bible is His Word. So we need to be able to connect that God to this Word, and that's what we're seeking to do. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at the prediction that God made through Ezekiel that the great city of Tyre would not only be attacked by many nations, but overthrown and scraped off the land and cast into the ocean. What God said would happen in 586 B.C. was literally fulfilled in 332 B.C., over 250 years before it took place, and it, it happened. I mean, how many cities have been scraped off the coast, I mean, off the rock, just cleaned off and thrown into the ocean, and for what purpose? Well, that, that's exactly what, what happened to Tyre as God said it would. Now, last week, that was the first one we saw. Last week, we looked at several predictions regarding Jesus, remember? We saw that He would come, and that was predicted from the very beginning, 4,000, actually 6,000, over 6,000 years ago. How He would come, again, I don't remember all the dates for these predictions, but how He would come being born of a virgin, again, hundreds of years before it happened, who he would be, son of God, son of man, where he would be born in Bethlehem, when he would begin his ministry, okay, 26, 27 A.D., when he would die, 30 A.D., how he would die by crucifixion, and that he would be raised again. Now, these were all fulfilled, as we saw, precisely as he said, though I think the prophecy having to do with when he would begin his ministry and, and um, uh, when it would end by his death, because it does, that prophecy did say that his ministry would end by his death, and what his death would accomplish is perhaps one of the more striking uh, because it gives us precise dates. Now, remember, the Bible, when He gives it to us, doesn't give us the exact date itself, but it does give us the exact number of years uh, 
that would pass from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah the Prince and how long he would minister before he was cut off or put to death, which is what those words mean. Now, again, we, we've looked at several prophecies so far, and any one of these would be enough to establish the Bible as God's word. Because, again, only an infinite God can tell the future. But I want us to look at one more prophecy that Jesus made during his lifetime that was fulfilled exactly as he said it would, and in the time frame in which he said it would. And as you know, that's the Olivet Discourse, which we find in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, so-called because it was given by Christ, spoken by Christ on the Mount of Olives, as we just read. We know that it's one of the most controversial passages in the Bible. I mean, just survey the many commentaries that have, writ that have been written about it, and you'll see that they're far from agreeing on how we should understand them. Okay, now at first glance, and I'm sure that all of us have gone through this. And we first became Christians and we're reading the Bible, and especially as we're reading it through the lens of, of our teachers. And most of the teachers today teach that the Olivet Discourse, most evangelical churches, the Olivet Discourse is really talking about the future, okay? At first glance, that's what Jesus seems to be talking about. What's going to happen just before his second coming at the end of the world? Or others would include at the end of the church age, uh, dispensationalism, for instance. And Jesus is warning us, um, and they believe it has particular reference to the time frame in which we're living, so that we would be sure to be ready for his coming and not miss out, so to speak, on the, uh, the rapture or not be ready for the second coming. But what I want us to consider this evening is that is not what he's talking about. Now, the key to understanding this passage is really to see the purpose behind this judgment. That is, who is the target audience? Who are the ones that are actually being judged here? And the time frame that Jesus gives for its fulfillment when he says these things are going to happen. Now, what I'd like for us to do this evening is just to break ground by looking at four reasons Jesus must have been speaking about the events surrounding 70 A.D. Now, let me just say before we get into this that if this view is correct, and remember, this is the view that R.C. Sproul took and explained to us in his series, The Last Days According to Jesus. If this view is correct, then it gives us strong evidence that the Bible is God's Word in two different ways. First of all, it gives us another example of fulfilled prophecy. But secondly, it establishes Jesus as a prophet, doesn't it? Okay. We already established that earlier. You know, um, There are many eyewitnesses who saw Jesus doing miracles, things that only Jesus could do, and that proved that he was a messenger sent from God. That's what miracles are supposed to do. But prophecy is also miraculous, I think we'd have to say. It, it's beyond or above what, what naturally or what ordinarily goes on. It's miraculous. It's a miracle. So the fact that Jesus could predict the future is another reason why we believe that he is a messenger sent from God, a true prophet, and as a prophet tells us the Bible is God's word, okay, and that he is the son of God. All right. So um, that's the importance of this passage and its fulfillment. Now, let's, um, let's first of all consider the possibilities of what this text could be referring to. And there's really only three possibilities when it comes to time frame. Okay? Jesus could be speaking of events that have already taken place in the past. He could be speaking of events that are yet future. Or he could be speaking of events that are partly in the past and partly in the future at least from our perspective, okay? Let's not forget when Jesus spoke these words, it was future from any of these perspectives. Everything he was talking about was yet in the future. Now, those who believe that all these events have already taken place are called full or radical preterists, and, and they do exist, okay? 
R.C. Sproul, when he wrote his book, The Last Days According to Jesus, he wrote the book interacting with a book that was written from that perspective. It was called The Parousia by J. Stuart Russell. Now, what R.C. did was he, he looked and read through the book, and he saw that, hey, um, Stuart Russell had some good things, some good observations about um, what some of these time frame references Jesus was referring to, what, what they actually had to do with. But he also saw that there were some problems with, with Russell's view. So he took the good and got rid of the bad, just like Calvin did when he wrote his Institutes. There was a lot of study that had gone on in the history of the church, and he said, well, here, here are the strong strands, and here are the weak strands, so we'll just put the strong ones together, get rid of the weak ones. And uh, so anyway, that's what R.C. did. Now, the position that Stuart Russell takes in the parousia and those who follow him is that they believe that all prophecy has been fulfilled. Everything Jesus spoke about, everything the Bible speaks about, everything the book of Revelation speaks about, all of it is done. The second coming has taken place. The rapture has taken place. The resurrection has taken place. The final judgment has taken place. And currently, we are living in the eternal state, <laughs> okay? That is what radical preterism teaches. By the way, we want to distinguish that from moderate preterism. So preterism is not a bad word, but radical preterism is how we would characterize that. Preterism simply means that these events have, are past tense. Okay, so they believe this, though, because of passages that, like, like the one we're looking at this evening. Because think about this, Jesus, at the beginning of the Olivet Discourse, seems clearly to be referring to the destruction of the temple, and we know that happened in 70 AD. But by the end of chapter 25, we are certain he is talking about the final judgment, which takes place after the second coming. So... Well, Stuart Russell looks at that and he says, Jesus is talking about the same event, okay? So we need to come to grips with that and we need to figure out why we believe that's not what it's referring to. Now, uh, one thing, we, we're not going to go through and try to refute the other positions. Uh, you know, hopefully by correctly understanding this passage, it will refute those other positions. But let me just say this about the radical preterist position that what we see now taking place in the world doesn't really seem to be how the Bible describes the eternal state. Okay, so I think that's probably the greatest refutation. Um, the eternal state is supposed to be a time of blessing where the Lord, uh, heaven and earth come together again and the creation is made new. Um, that is not what we see taking place now, but we hope for that yet in the future. Now, most dispensationalists, and I say that just in case there might be some who have broken out of this view, it was, it was dispensationalism when I was taught it, believe that the Olivet Discourse is refer referring exclusively to the future, that Jesus is talking about events that will take place just prior to the rapture, during the seven-year tribulation, and at the second coming. Now, I think what we're going to look at this evening is going to be enough to show us that this view can't be correct. And then, most Reformed scholars, and again, I'm just going to say most just in case there are some that disagree. I think there are some pre-mill Reformed scholars. But those of the all-mill and post-mill persuasion believe that what Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse are partly of events that have taken place in the past and partly of events that will take place in the future. The difference between the views mainly has to do with where one stops and the other begins, right? And, and different scholars have different places where they, they put that break, but they, there has to be a break in there somewhere. And we'll look at maybe one of the reasons why, why Jesus does what he does. Why does he start in one place and then end up in another place, okay? Well, there, there's probably a good reason for that. All right. Now, uh, the, the partial or moderate preterist position that R.C. held sees this prophecy as being fulfilled in 70 A.D., not as in its entirety. Um, that They believe that Jesus maybe, well, not all of them, but some of them believe that Jesus doesn't really begin speaking about his second coming 
until somewhere in chapter 25. And really, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, it seems, at least to me, that Jesus is clearly speaking about 70 AD all the way through 24. And then there's an area at the beginning of 25 where he's talking about the parable of the virgins and the parable of the talents where it looks like it could go one way or the other. And then he goes clearly into the second coming. So it's almost like, okay, 80, 70, this transition, things that apply really to both, both directions and then something that's clearly you know, in, in the second coming. So again, where these, this division takes place, uh, we're not really quite sure, but R.C. believed that the portion we're looking at, the one that I just read, was all fulfilled by 70 A.D. In a nutshell, this, this is what he believed, that Jesus was telling his disciples what would happen in their near future that he was coming to destroy Jerusalem because of the Jews' rejection of him and that they needed to pay attention. They needed to pay attention. They needed to be on the alert so that when it happens, they would be able to get out of the city and out of the country when they saw it coming and escape it. You know, they're, again, historically, when the Christians would listen to Jesus... <laughs> and were aware of his warnings, saw the Roman soldiers coming to surround Jerusalem, which is what brought about its destruction in 70 AD. They got out of the country, and they survived. Uh, those that got trapped in the city, most of them perished, and it was one of the, 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 well, how would you say, one of the most horrible situations that has ever existed in the history of mankind, perhaps the worst. Jesus said it is the worst that's ever happened. And when you read Josephus' account, you, you can agree with it, even worse than the Holocaust. Now, because this event is an example of God's terrible judgment, certainly is, what, what I think is happening here is that Jesus projects or telescopes his warning further into the future in chapter 25 to a very similar event that is coming, that is even worse. And that is when he comes on that final day to judge all mankind, that even as the disciples need to be ready for his judgment in 70 AD, how much more do we need to be ready for the final judgment, which is coming when Jesus returns on that final day? So that's what I think is going on in chapters 24 and 25. But now let's, let's look at four reasons why Jesus must be speaking in our text of the passages, or excuse me, the events leading up to and including 70 AD. And let's begin with the target audience of this judgment. Now, if we read the Olivet Discourse in its context, we would see that in the preceding chapter, chapter 23, Jesus has just finished pronouncing eight woes or curses on the leaders of Israel, culminating with his greatest um, curse, okay? He says, because of their rejection and constant persecution, both of himself and of his prophets and of those that he was about to send, that he was going to hold them guilty of all the righteous blood spilled on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, the first martyr, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, Jesus, after saying that, says in the very next verse, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Okay, now we're going to come back to this generation because that's a very important time frame, but I want you to see that Jesus is pronouncing a curse on the Jewish leaders and on that generation for all the crimes that have been committed against him, against God, against the prophets, against those Jesus will even send during that time frame before the judgment comes. So essentially, their rejection of everything that God had blessed them with, the law, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, the priesthood, the institutions, all that it was pointing to was, of course, Christ. Their rejection of Christ himself and of all his servants, 
and of everything God promised to them in Christ was a crime that is so great because committed against so great light and so great privilege that the consequences would be devastating. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion when he was talking about Capernaum and he says it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you, Capernaum. And why? Is it because Capernaum was, was more wicked than Sodom and Gomorrah? No, it was because Jesus did miracles and he taught in their streets. They had all this privilege and yet they rejected him. And in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were just plain wicked, did wicked things and they were destroyed. But in the day of judgment, it's going to be worse for Capernaum because they had greater light. Well, the Jews had the greatest light and they rejected all that light and all that privilege. And so Jesus says the consequences would be devastating. Now, we know that our Lord did not on many occasions mourn. But Luke tells us that the judgment that was coming was so terrible that when Jesus came near to the city of Jerusalem at his triumphal entry, that this is what he did. Now, we read in Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children with you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Notice that Jesus is speaking of the very thing that he is talking about in the Olivet Discourse, you know, that Jerusalem's going to be leveled, that the temple's going to be leveled. And why is that? It's because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. And Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem because of the judgment coming upon them. So what would that judgment entail? Well, again, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and so would the temple. Jesus says in verse 38, and I believe that is of Luke 19, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Now, that's very instructive because the, the house that he's referring to here is the temple, okay? That is, that is the house, okay? The house of God, although here it's called your house. Um, so he's speaking here about the temple becoming desolate. And that's what Jesus also refers to in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, where he says this, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, and if you remember last week, we actually did look at that. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in the Judea must flee to the mountains. That abomination of desolation um, meant a couple of things. It, it meant that the Romans would take over, would take Jerusalem. They would come and desecrate the temple. They would set up their standards in the temple. They would dismount, uh, dismantle the temple. The temple, the house, uh, was being left desolate. So they had rejected the king of Israel. They had rejected the Lord of the covenant. And now he was rejecting them. Now, think about this because oftentimes we, we, don't, we don't understand the connection between all these things. But... Jesus said earlier in Matthew 21, verse 43, and by the way, when Jesus said this, he was in the temple, and everything he said from that point forward through Matthew 23 was all in the temple, and he was speaking to the leaders of Israel, okay? So he said in Matthew 21, verse 43, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And what he's talking here about is the desolation of the Jews, bringing judgment upon them and giving the kingdom to another people who would produce the fruit. And who are those people? But they are the believing Jews and Gentiles who receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the church, we might say the continuing church, as God is, is, well, Jesus, you know, John the Baptist said, Jesus has a winnowing fork in his hands, and he's going to uh, 
you know, winnow the, the, uh, the, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff, and that's what his ministry was all about. Well, now the chaff is going to be burned up, and he's going to gather the wheat. The wheat is the church, and the church is the one that's going to carry on the work of the kingdom and produce that fruit. All that was left for the Jews was destruction, and that is the subject of the Olivet Discourse, which directly follows these curses and these warnings from chapter 21 through chapter 23. Now, I want to come back just for a moment to what Jesus said, your house is being left to you desolate. He did not say, my father's house is going to be desolated. And what he meant by that is God had rejected that temple, okay? And Jesus is seen to symbolize that. By after he, he finishes his rebukes, he then leaves the temple, and he leaves it for the last time. Okay, he withdraws from it. Uh, his discussion with the Jewish leaders took place in the temple, as I said. It began in Matthew 21, verse 23. It continues all the way to the end of chapter 23. And when Jesus left that temple for the last time, the glory of Israel departed, because he was the glory of Israel. He departed you know, from the temple, and when they crucified him, remember, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, showing that the Lord had rejected that house, that approach to him was no longer valid, and now the new Israel, that nation that would produce the fruit of it, the church would approach God in a new way, and that would be through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, getting back to the main point now, which is, which is this, okay, to whom is Jesus speaking? You know, what, to whom is the Olivet Discourse directed against? It's, it's directed against that generation that rejected him, you know, upon whom all the, the righteous blood shed on earth would fall. Now, the second reason we should believe, in, and all these reasons aren't going to be as long as the first one, so don't, um, don't become concerned. The second reason we should believe Jesus was speaking of 70 AD is because of the questions that he's answering in our passage. Now, we just said Jesus left the temple for the last time at the end of Matthew 23, and as Jesus came from the temple and was leaving, his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. You know, they were walking with Jesus, and they had heard what Jesus said, and they understood something of what he was saying about the fact the temple was going to be made desolate. And they were wondering how these buildings with such massive stones could possibly be overthrown. You know, Josephus tells us that the Romans, and when they besieged Jerusalem, which we just read about actually in, in Luke, when they besieged Jerusalem, they beat against the walls of Jerusalem with their battering rams for six days, Josephus tells us, without even putting a dent in them, <laughs> you know, without leaving an impression. These were, these were huge stones that the walls and the temple were built of. Okay, so they're pointing out the temple to Jesus, and Jesus answered them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. When Titus finally overthrew the city in 70 AD, he ordered that the city and the temple be completely dismantled. There was not one stone left upon another. Now, this statement by Christ piqued the disciples' curiosity. And so they came to him privately as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is just across the Kidron Valley, opposite the temple, where they would have a clear view of the temple, and asked, tell us, when will these things be? As you're talking about, not one stone left upon another. When is, when is that going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, notice that the disciples were tying all these questions together to this one event. And I think that's a cue, you know, because Jesus was talking about the temple, the destruction of the temple. He wasn't talking about his second coming. Uh, and so they're not suddenly asking him about the second coming, but they're asking him questions that have to do with the destruction of the temple. When will the temple be torn down? What is the sign? that this is about to take place. Now, when, he says, when they say, you're coming, what they mean by that is, when are you coming in judgment against Jerusalem and against the temple? Because we know this is going to be your judgment. And of the end of the age. 
And I think what he means here is the end of the Jewish age and the beginning of that arrangement that Jesus spoke about in the parable of the vineyard. The kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away and given to another nation that will produce its fruit. And I think it's important that we see it that way because there, there actually was an end of an age when the temple was destroyed, and it was the end of the Jewish age. And the reason why we have to see that there was another age after that is when Jesus said to the Pharisees on one occasion, he said, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, he says, anything spoken against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, not in this age or the age that is coming. What, what could Jesus possibly mean by that? Well, not in this age that where we currently are in the Old Covenant, but not in the New Covenant age either. He's not talking about the eternal state, you know, because, well, uh, there's not going to be any sin in, in that. So the fact that it wouldn't be forgiven, people aren't going to be committing that sin in the eternal state. Now, again, the disciples saw these events as all being tied together, and they wanted to know when they were going to happen. Those are the questions that Jesus is answering in the Olivet Discourse, and they are tied to the destruction of the temple, okay? So the target audience are the Jews. This is God's judgment against them. Jesus, in Saying what he says in the Olivet Discourse is answering the question of the disciples. When is the temple going to be taken down? When is it going to be torn apart? Now, that's why we should see this as 70 AD. Now, thirdly, we should see Jesus speaking of 70 AD. The third reason is because all the warnings we just read were directed to his disciples, okay? Um, not to a future generation, but to them, let me give you a few examples. He says in verse 4, see to it that no one misleads you. In verse 6, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. In verse 9, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated. And we're going to see how some of these things were fulfilled, but I want you to notice he's speaking to them. Verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation... Verse 20, but pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. And so on to verse 33, where he says, even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Uh, his, his point, and, and you know, again, if we were to look beyond that passage, beyond, you know, to the verses following, verse 35, his point is this in verse 42, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. And again, directed to the disciples, like the rest of it is, he was not talking to a future generation saying to us, we need to be on the alert because we don't know the day's coming. We don't know the day of his second coming for sure, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. You do not know when I'm coming, Jesus says, to bring about these curses and this destruction on Israel and to destroy the temple. These warnings, since these warnings were really directed to them so that they might avoid this judgment, Jesus must have been referring to something that would take place during their lifetime and not in the far distant future. Okay, so again, the target audience, remember, and he's answering the question, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And Jesus is warning them to be ready because it's going to happen during your lifetime. Now, fourth and finally, we should see Jesus is speaking about 70 AD because he gives the disciples a clear time frame in which all these things are, are going to be completed. And let's not forget, this was R.C.'s main point in uh, his series. In verse 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, you probably are aware that... Um, and. <laughs> There are those who understand this generation to refer to this race of people. You know, the Jews will not pass away until all these things, you know, take place. And, 
And so that's how they escape the fact that it's directed toward the people living then uh, to in the future. But the fact is the word generation, if it's used that way at all, it would be very seldom. When that word is used, R.C. gave us many examples. Generation always refers to the people who are then living. Okay? And notice he uses the near demonstrative, this and not the far demonstrative, that, the generation living at the time Jesus pronounced his curse upon Israel was the generation that would see and experience all these things. Now, when Jesus said, gave the Olivet Discourse, 70 AD was 40 years away because this is 30 AD. And 40 years is the time frame of one generation, according to Hebrew calculation. Okay, so there's the four reasons. Okay, the target audience, and again, the questions that Jesus is answering about the destruction of, of the uh, temple, the warnings directly to the disciples that um, they had to be ready because this event was going to take place in their lifetime. And then finally, what Jesus says here, that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I just wanted to note one more thing, and, I, and that is just drawing back on Daniel's prophecy. Okay, what we saw last week of the 70 weeks. Remember what, what we saw from that. That prophecy tells us when Jesus would begin his ministry. Remember after 69 weeks? 69 weeks after the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We saw when the decree was issued. We saw, you know, the 69 weeks of years and it calculated out to 26 or 27 A.D. We know that Jesus was born around 3 B.C. We know he was about 30 years of age when he began his ministry. That would place him around 26, 27 uh, A.D., 30 years of age. Okay. We know from the 70 weeks of Daniel when that ministry would end, how it would end, that he would be cut off in the middle of the 70th week. Okay. Middle of the week, the middle of seven years is three and a half years. We know his ministry lasted for three and a half years, so he would die around 30 A.D., Jesus is speaking, of course, about the Olivet Discourse just before he dies, so it's in 30 AD. Now, Daniel also tells us what the effects of this would be, the effects of his being cut off, of his death, that he would put an end to sacrifice and grain offering. He would abolish the old covenant sacrificial system, which is what 70 AD is all about. It's tearing down the temple, saying, God is saying, not, not just bringing judgment on the Jews, but he's saying, you cannot come to me in this way any longer. Actually, when he tore the veil, that, that also, I mean, that was the, the end. But he did allow the temple to stand for those 40 years while the gospel was going out, first of all, to the Jew and then to the Gentile before he brought judgment on them. He he wanted to make sure that all of his people got a chance to, to hear about the fulfillment of his promises before he brought judgment. But then um, Daniel goes, goes on to say this in Daniel 9, 26. Then after the 62 weeks, which is after the seven, so after the 69 weeks or during the 70th week, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Now notice what it says here. And the people of the prince who is to come... And by the way, the prince who is coming is not the Antichrist, but in the context of Daniel 9, the prince is Messiah the prince. And the people of the prince who is to come, the people of Messiah, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, Daniel here, or I should say Gabriel, who gave him this prophecy, he's referring to exactly the same event that Jesus is speaking about in Matthew 24, the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, which is the temple. Now, Gabriel does not say that it happens within the week. He just simply projects past the middle of the week. He doesn't say when that happens. But Jesus tells us in our passage when that's going to take place. It's going to take place within the lifetime of that generation. Or it's all going to be concluded by 70 
AD. So I hope, I hope you see all those points because it really fits together very well. And, and I would say from, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that that's what, what this is referring to. And we're going to look at some of those issues of why we might want to see this as something different. But let's not forget these references because this is the key to understanding this passage. And only if we want to take just one of these keys, we should take that one that has to do with the time frame. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So next week, we're going to continue to look at some of the things Jesus is talking about, the signs of when this is going to take place and what happens when it does and what's going to happen after this event. All right, well, let's, um, let's just bow for a moment of prayer and let's just thank the Lord for His truth and the fact that He warns us in advance of things that are coming so that we can be ready for them.